Day five, the animated series tear along the dotted line and specifically its British dub, suggested by Stiglitz and seconded by probably the same 17 people who wanted me to see all about Lily Shushu. Why don't you people want me to be happy? BoJack Horseman released its final set of episodes the day after The Good Place had its series finale, which is to say, on the same day that finale hit Hulu, January 31st, 2020. I'm not sure I've ever cried as much in front of my television as I did on that day. I wanted to talk about them on the channel. I mean, I'd reviewed their penultimate seasons, but though I started a few different versions of each, including one where I talked about both, it never went anywhere. And that's fine. The world isn't worse for me not figuring out what to say about them, just as it isn't better for me having figured out what to say about anything else. None of us are really that important. It's one of the key messages of Tear Along the Dotted Line, a show that will inevitably draw comparisons to BoJack Horseman because it's an animated series on Netflix for adults that deals with existential crises and depression, anxiety, etc., etc., and also features talking animals alongside regular humans. But this is no cheap knockoff. In fact, these stories and this style predate BoJack by three years. While the show premiered in 2021, the stories depicted were contained in cartoonist Cerro Calcare's first graphic novel a decade before. La Profezia del Armadillo, or The Armadillo's Prophecy, refers to a recurring character in Calcare's work, a physical manifestation of his conscience who shows up at inopportune times to tell him how he really feels about what's going on. And so these animals aren't literally animals, but metaphors. His overbearing mother is a hen, the squeaking little girls he tutored are mice, etc. His stories exist in the real world, but we are getting them filtered through both time and artistic license. And it takes full advantage of the opportunities afforded by animation. Styles can shift and characters can distort at a moment's notice without it ever feeling strange. Sequences call back to a wide number of popular films and shows in what could be considered your usual cutaway gags, but I think they're a step above because they give you insight into the storyteller's influences in a very literal way. And I need to emphasize storytelling, because Tear Along the Dotted Lines is unlike any television program I've ever seen in the way its narrator guides the story. And like, I don't know if it's actually that unique within the medium, or maybe I just don't watch that much interesting TV, but it reminds me a lot more like something I'd see on stage. Little vignettes from life that he will comment over, and then periods where he comes on screen to give additional details. And in fact, the original Italian recording has Sero Calcare playing every single character except for the armadillo, at least for the first five of the six episodes. This heightens the feeling that we're watching a performance piece in a way that the British dub, which features multiple voice actors playing other parts, doesn't. And while it presumably makes the tonal shift of episode 6 hit even harder, I don't think it's worth it for someone who isn't fluent in Italian. He speaks too quickly in a way that is actively distracting and forces you to look away from those sumptuous visuals. This is a show that doesn't benefit from being part of this month of hot takes. It is something that you should give time to and sit with between episodes. There is a lot on its mind, and binging really is not the best way to experience that. Had I had more time, I would probably speak at length about episode six, where the seeds that he sows over previous episodes sprout all at once in a way that is deeply affecting and painful. But I've got a word limit to stick to, so I'm gonna to stick to the bigger picture. Whether this show works for you will ultimately depend on how much you can relate to Sero, his bad choices, and the frequently frustrating back and forth he has with his armadillo. He hews as closely as he can to the dotted line that he imagines fate is pulling him along, never trying to rock the boat or meaningfully change because what if it doesn't work out? He'd rather have nothing than pain. And while his couple of friends will call out his generally shitty behavior, to what end? The idea that maybe he started to understand that he's not really the center of the universe is hard to swallow when he's turned this story into a fucking Netflix series. But who am I to talk? When a friend told me she was getting married back in 2016, I don't remember exactly what I said, but I sure do remember her response. How did you make me getting married about you? 
is 100% the sort of moment that you would see in this show. And so maybe my frustration with Sarah is really frustration with myself. Maybe I saw too much of me in this show, and that's not what I want looking back in the mirror. Seven point nine out of ten. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you particularly to my patrons: my mom, Hamry and Marco, Kat Saracata, Benjamin Schiff, Anthony Cole, Magnolia Denton, Elliot Fowler, Greg Lucina, Kojo, Phil Bates, Willow. I Am The Sword, Riley Zimmerman, Claire Bear, Taylor Lindis, and the folks who'd rather be read than said. If you like this video, that's great. If you want to see more, suggest what I should watch or review in like three days. Awesome. See ya then. Bye.